Hi, everybody, and welcome to another Flowable video. I'm honored to be presenting today together with Valentin. Hi, Valentin. Hi, Joram. I'm happy that you are here. I think it's another good day for our release video since we mm -hmm. just released the summer release 316. What are we going to see? Well, as usual, the 316 release contains a ton of things. But I think to get started, the easiest would be to start where most people start their global journey, that is in global design. And the one thing I like to show you first is the renewed app overview screens that we've been working on. Perfect. Let's start with that. So you I'm looking at that, that looks like it always looked. What did change? Yeah, well, I was trying to go for some kind of dramatic buildup here. So indeed, now we're at the workspaces, which is exactly the same as before. So let's click on this. And uh, you see, I've got two apps and the one I'm going to open up uh, now. Th is there's the... a small change here. Actually, we see already the breadcrumbs at the top. Of. True, 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 true. Yeah, you can see the breadcrumbs here. And actually, they are available everywhere that you are. So if I go into my loan app, you can see two things here. You can see the breadcrumbs, mm -hmm. but you can also see the thing that I wanted to showcase today is the new app overview page. So the idea with this is that you have um, a sort of a landing page for your app that you can customize as you kind of mm -hmm. want. Um, as you can see here, we have main models now open. Main models are the ones that are typically the root models. And in this case, I've got and a loan how case. How does it detect which are the main models? I mean, is there some... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So basically, there are a few things like uh, if it's a root a root model, like a process or a case that is at the root of yeah. things and it is not included as a child into other ones. Uh, a few other model types, uh, like pages, for example, you can see here, these are get a special place. All yeah. the other ones you can still find in the old models. Or if you like the old view, let's say it's not gone okay. or something, it's still here and you can still go and use that one as before. So you have the overview and you have the models both give you the same yeah. information only in a different way structured. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the model kind of views. And what you have here is start, for example. Right now, I okay. only start this one. Now, interesting okay. to, to... You started, so it's personal yeah. to your account or... It is, it is, it is. So if I, for example, I just take any random one, like uh, say yeah. this one here, and I start... This one, mm -hmm. I go here, you can see that yeah. actually it is start. And this is personally for me. So somebody else that has access to this app will not okay. see this model. So actually, I use this feature quite a lot because I typically work on a few models uh, at, the, at the same time. And I start these and I can easily uh, find yeah. them. Now, the other so two you tabs... you can also change them over the time, basically. Yes. The models yes. you are currently working on, you can start them. Uh, exactly. Since... I can simply unstart them here. And all the other options, yeah. like you know the, the kind of usage is here yeah. uh, and you know okay. all the stuff that was there before um the other two tabs are quite you know straightforward there is the modified this just gives you the list of yeah. um the models that were ordered by a modification date uh, mm -hmm. you know if you just in the morning after your cup of coffee you come online yeah. you want to see what's happened you can go here or the ones that are modified by me you know filtered mm -hmm. by the stuff that i yeah. I touched here. Um, so this is the kind of models part. Okay. And then on the right hand side, there's a few kind of, as you call it internally, uh, the mm -hmm. cards, pages, uh, because a lot yeah. of our customers, they use pages intensively. They yeah, have got a really a... good entry point, basically, exactly. to get into your Exactly. So that's configured here. You can, you, know, you can click on them and you can you know, see them. Uh, another one is the revisions, uh, because we, we've seen that many people, they use revisions to kind of um, introduce milestones in in a certain yeah. project you saw if you see here you got two draw I mean, versions it's, created it's, it's basically your version controller exactly exactly indeed indeed and you can do whatever you want here mm -hmm. uh interesting enough there's also an api here you can hook into um well an, an api to hook into whenever a revision is created that yeah. you can get the full content of everything and do oh. things like pushing it into a git repository or other version control or stuff like that. So that's a pluggability, technical pluggability interface that, is, that we also have. Really yeah. cool. I think a lot of technical people like that to see basically that it is yeah. uh, sent to a yeah. Git repository, for example. Yeah, exactly. It's on new or they that's haven't been also, there before. No, that is new. That's fully new. Um, mm -hmm. So what we've seen is that when you're working with large apps, um, that people use a lot of documents and that's normally in any yeah. kind of IT project, I would say. Um, you've got your, as you can see here, right? I mean, you've got your requirements documents, your word documents yeah. from, from business analysts, from meetings with, with yeah. the actual end users. You've got your timeline here. I mean, anything really goes. There's no 
kind of limitation here and whatever you want to put in the document you can put there and everybody that has access to these to the app has automatically access yeah. to these documents so this is really like a collaboration feature uh, to work easier with uh, things that are happening in reality i would say you could also for example include basically some kind of a getting started guide to get started with your app and so on for example as i always say right your imagination is a limitation here yeah, so yeah. yeah i think that's that's about it what i wanted to show about uh this new feature and i really like it i mean it's really um i'm using it now for for a long yeah. time and i really i'm used to yeah, it and like that's, that's the advantage when you work in the product team you can already <laughs> use it before it was released so let's go that's to true. the next topic Let's continue with the plugin concept. When are we going to use plugins? And an example is there you have a service model and you would like to make that as easy as possible for a non-technical person to use it. And in addition to that, you can also go ahead and share it between different design instances without being that technical. So yeah. let's look into that. Yeah. I think a real life use case would be if you're like a, a partner, you've got multiple customers and you've built your range of services that, that you mm -hmm. always use or, or give to these customers, then you really want to install it as easy as possible into any no design instance. Um, another use case would be uh, in a big company, there's a centralized kind of global installation and you want to make sure that all departments use the same tasks in their CMN models, in their BPM models, mm -hmm. kind of make that all nice and easy to maintain, that's where plugins come in. So um, what is new here, if you start creating a new workspace, okay. you can see here, there's now yeah. a new thing here, contain apps or plugins. Now, when you're modeling, it's actually very much like you're modeling an app, right? You're building like an artifact mm -hmm. with models. But in this case, there's a bit of difference because the idea is you're going to kind of distribute these. So let's go ahead. Okay. Let's also so name. we first need to create a new workspace. In that workspace, we are then basically yeah. adding our plugins. So next exactly. thing, what you probably do is create I'm going to create plugin. my plugin. There we go. Yeah, I'm just going to call yeah, it my yeah. first plugin. <laughs> the yeah, Hello yeah, World. Always. Naming is hard, but yep. let's try. So there's two options. There is services, <laughs> as Valentin told you, and there is a plugin task. The service is the actual kind of implementation of what you want to do behind the scenes and the plugin task is how you want to model it inside of the palette. So let's assume we already have a service. Can we go ahead yeah. and just uh, import that here? Good idea. I yeah. think I've got a service Oops. right yeah. here somewhere. There we go. Okay. So and now you have a service model, which you already yeah. actually is that not the one you use in the webinar? Correct is a credit check we use in the AI webinar yeah. that we use to kind of enhance um, all the other the app basically to to generate new models mm -hmm. and this is yeah this is exactly the same one it's, yeah, okay nothing spectacular except you know yeah. a couple of input parameters saves me from typing quite a bit yeah output parameters and here we go okay all right so we've got now this um, let's say we yeah. get the service now now we can mm -hmm. create the so let's call this one my the plugin uh, task is basically the new thing so that wasn't yeah. there before that's now a task which we are creating basically yeah. a palette item and yeah. uh here you are going to then okay i'm just going to create an icon you know uh yeah, yeah. See if i can find the thumbs up here we go Always yeah good. credit I've... check i mean thumbs up makes sense in the best case you have a good credit <laughs> so you're getting yeah, exactly thumbs up. So I'm saying now I want to show these, this task in both process and case mm -hmm. models. I'm linking it now to my service model. Here we go. Okay. And I'm selecting the single operation that it had. Yeah. And it opens up this whole UI. Now, um, there's a bit of configuration here in the sense that mm -hmm. what we found is that what people always want to configure is whether it's asynchronous and the color. So you can configure yeah. these. You can say, OK, it should be asynchronous exclusive by default, or you should say, my service should never be asynchronous, right? So mm -hmm. just disable it. Let's just disable this one here. Um, okay. then, so that is then not going to be visible to the user. You just have correct. configured it and the person doesn't even need to know what is asynchronous exactly. or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Which most of the cases, you know, you can choose whether this service is by default asynchronous or yeah. not. Right, which is yeah. something you know as I a builder mean, of the service. De depending on the operation which your service is calling yeah. out, if that is setting something or 
Yeah, don't correct. doesn't do that. I think that makes sense to have it here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we've got two things for the service. We've got the input. We've got the output. There's two options here. Mm -hmm. uh, one is to, as you can read here, to show the input parameters on the top level, meaning they will, yeah. as I will show you later on, on the right hand side, they will show up as a top level property in the first tab mm -hmm. of when you select this task. Or the alternative is that you map them into the service registry kind of standard pop-up. Remember, if you have a service task, yeah. you click on it, gives you a pop-up and you map these things into it. So that basically, when we choose this one, it will look as the service registry always yeah. looks. And when we pick yeah. the other one, then we have basically okay. our own task. So let's go for our uh, own task. That's probably more special. Yeah, sounds fine. So the thing is, I need to select now these things here. I'm mm -hmm. just going to use the same names. Let's say here we're gonna do hello Valentin just to show something. Yeah. I'm not gonna bother with you know setting all of these one by one. Yeah. Just the idea, uh, you get you get it right. Um, yes. The zip code, yeah. big debate always, right? In Belgium, it's always a number. The rest of the world, yeah. not necessarily. Uh, here we go. Yeah. But yeah, just a joke. I just leave it all. I mean, it doesn't really matter for this demo, right? Let's just leave all as yeah. is. Output parameters, same story, right? Do you want to have it as a mm -hmm. top level property or you want to show it in the service registry? kind of yeah. output parameters uh, again. So same story, yeah. Let's same story. Just yeah, just go to continue, right? That's it. That's it. So we now have our plugin, right? We've created okay. a service and it contains a configuration for the palette. So Okay, and how are you going that. to use that plugin? You are... Yeah, I'm going to export it. So that okay. gives me a nice plugin bar. Mm -hmm. Here we go. And you see, you know, I've been trying this out. This is why it says, you know, number three yeah, yeah. <laughs> already. <laughs> a little bit of, of practice, of, of course, okay. beforehand. So uh, what I can do now, I can go here at the top right corner, and there mm -hmm. is something cool, so which is new, plugin you management. You use a symbol, basically, and there you select the plugin management, and yeah. here you have then the import button, basically. There's, there's, not, there's basically it. nothing, exactly. There's nothing installed yeah. yet. So let's click it. I can now select if I'm in a multi-tenant, uh, design, mm -hmm. I can say which tenant they should get. So you can actually say, this is really interesting if you're this centralized platform, right? Where mm -hmm. you have multiple departments, multiple tenants, and you want to install the plugins depending on just, the department, right? Just for one single department, you can add a plugin yeah. for multiple departments, yeah. Exactly. There you go. It's installed now in our design instance, uh, which means behind the scene, it is actually kind of merging palettes and all of that. I mean, I'm simplifying yeah. things now, it works. Is, it's actually is it way more already complex. merging palettes, no, or no. do you first need to go to a workspace and yeah, actually set exactly, that you exactly. would like to use the plugin? Yeah. So that's what I actually now did. I went into the release 316 workspace. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a new option here now called linked plugins, right? Okay. Nothing linked right now. Linking it here. And here we go. Now, the interesting bit about this is that you can actually have way than, you know, just not one, but multiple yeah. ones, right? Way more than one. Uh, basically, uh, at runtime, when I'm now going into a process or case, it will mm -hmm. actually merge all of these things together, which means that I can have plugins from different kind of sources, yeah. right? And they will all be merged into this one thing, which is a really powerful kind of, kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? So let's see if I open up my loan app. It's just, it's a very simple process. Doesn't really matter for this, okay. uh, but you can see, right here, Valentin, yes. there is now a new section called my first plugin and okay. it has my task. And if I drag yeah. it into the process. We should have process, called it credit check actually, then it would That match would have been well. smarter. I know, okay. yeah, yeah. Naming does not Next our time. <laughs> Yeah. All right, but the most important thing here is that I have my properties. And I remember mm -hmm. you said that I needed to map them as kind of root properties. Yeah. And now they're shown in the main kind of tab. Um, I just configured one help text yeah. here. Hello, Valentin. That's nice. And you know, here we go. Just not really yeah. uh, spectacular <laughs> here, but it works. Right? The thing is that yeah. it works, meaning when I run this at runtime, it will actually use that service task, that, that REST API behind mm -hmm. the scenes. But for me, I just installed it. I don't know where I got this plugin yeah. from and installed right. it and basically got the feature, right? Yeah, so, so you don't need to know anything. I mean, you don't even need to know that there's a REST API behind it. Correct. It will just execute Correct. that REST API yeah. when you're yeah. using it. That exactly. And so a really sense. powerful feature to kind of customize uh, really heavily how you're exposing things uh, mm -hmm. to your models, basically. So yeah, that's it. That's a really cool feature. So let's move on to the next feature. Now we have already seen great new features in Flowable Design. Now there's way more in Flowable Design in 3.16, which is new. What are your favorites, Johan? 
Yeah, given the limited time you have for the release videos, there's a lot of you know features and additions in 3.16, but I think two of them I really want to show to you today, Vant. And the first one being the model diffing. Now you will say we had model diffing in the past. Uh, that's true, but I, it is fully revamped, fully yeah. rewritten, and it'll show in a second why. What I have here is the loan app. Diffing is basically seeing the differences between two versions. Correct. So whenever you Correct. press save, it's generating a new version. Indeed, indeed. So uh, okay. here I just open up the loan case. It doesn't really matter, right? And it works mm -hmm. for anything. Um, so let's say I have this new task here and yeah. uh, I'm just going to change, for example, the required flag from yeah. checked to unchecked, from true to okay. false. And what I also want to let's, do is... Yeah, we name it. Yeah. That's... Yep. So let's just make this one changed. Okay, yeah. Here we go. Naming we save always it. hard. <laughs> yep. Okay, and, and then you go. This, the model versions is basically the last icon in the menu Correct. bar which you pressed. Oh yeah, and sorry, I should have highlighted that. that. Right, I just pressed this one here. Basically, yeah. this is the new. This is new in three sixteen, and it gives yeah. you on the left hand side for this particular model. It gives me. You can mm -hmm. see I've been playing around with this quite a bit. Yeah. You can yeah. see that there is different versions, uh, and okay. I can go back and actually see what it was. Yeah. That's for Everyone. every time when you press save, but when you would like to give it specific names, then you go for the app. With That's the stuff we discussed before, right? So if you want to yeah. create a specific app revision version mm -hmm. where you kind of mark it as a, as a milestone in your project, yeah. you can also see the difference there with your, and, with your uh, model. And for the app revision, you, only, uh, you not only save one model, you save basically right. all the different Everything. models. With Everything. that, basically, you yeah. have something consistent to jump back. Correct. While Correct. the model uh, versions is basically more the history of your current model. So in case yeah. you did yeah, for example, mistake there... Yeah, or somebody else. Uh, what we were doing, one, you can jump yeah, back. Exactly. So what we were doing before, we, we renamed it to changed, right? It's showing still here mm -hmm. the previous version. If I now click yeah. the compare with version, now there's also a button to revert to that particular version if I want to yeah. do that. But let's now click Press compare, and okay. you can actually see here it's highlighted that the mm -hmm. new edition changed into changed, right? Okay. And if yeah. I click it, kind you can actually sense. see it, it works from left to right, right? So this is yeah. the older version towards mm -hmm. the newer version. You can see yeah. you went from checked to unchecked, true to false, and from yeah. new edition to changed. And right? you can actually even select another version then at the top in case you would like to see the difference to another yeah. version. If so I want to go to another version here. There. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, now it also, you know, doesn't only work with additions. It also works like if I if I remove one here, let's say. Okay. You know, so I so. remove one here and I add a new one here and I okay. save it again. And yeah. go into the revisions, compare again the latest one with this version. Yeah. It's... And then we see yeah. now basically that you moved that one out since you created the task basically, which has yeah. probably the same ID. Uh, and we changed a lot of the attributes since all the default values basically went away. Kind of makes Correct. sense, yes. Yep. All right. So that's one of the features. The other one I wanted to kind of show to you is mm -hmm. the uh, service registry mapping. I mean, if you've worked with service registry mappings, You'll yeah. know that it's always hard to kind of fill these things in. It's uh, sometimes some services have a lot of input output parameters. Um, yeah. And what I have here, and let me just link it real quickly. I've got the example service. Mm -hmm. I've got I, an important yeah. stuff operation. Yeah. And the UI, that's, which is now changed, yeah, that's is really this important. one. Okay, exactly. So now, now we have new basically that is showing us the type. What is also that question mark which we have behind some of the? Yeah, types? the question mark is kind of like it is like example uh, data, okay. or it is if you have some more description, you can add it here. And you can see, for example, this one here is more elaborate yeah. because it's a JSON example and it has mm -hmm. uh, kind of an example. And if you remember in the older versions, it was a table kind of yeah. this where you fill it in, and I did, now we enhance it to really give you type yeah. information, give you, you know, just more general information. It also works for the output mm -hmm. mapping. And you can see that, yeah. you know, uh, it looks same here. way so, nicer than before. I mean, you have way more context, yeah. which is really helpful. Now, when you basically save that, and then when we go back to the model uh, version, we actually mm -hmm. should see that basically we added now as well that new task in here. Or... Yeah, absolutely. And you and... let's compare it. And yeah. there it is. Yeah. Now, now we green. see basically right. that one is green since it's really a new task and it's not yep. detecting it as we move that one out. Okay. That's really nice. Yeah. Cool. Then let's move on to the execution side. 
Now we changed a lot of things in Flowable Forms. Uh, one of those things is actually the tab component. What have we yeah. changed there since the tab component was already there since a while ago? Yeah, that's that's correct. So um, I mean, I've created a very small example. I'm just to show you because mm -hmm. that's just easier. Uh, here it is. Um, so basically, the the main thing here is that the tab component, as you say, has been there for quite a while. It was always horizontal, and as you can see on the screen here, it is now vertical. Um, many nice. people are building these kind of UIs these days. Um, yeah. Basically, yeah, as you can see here, if I click it yeah. and if I go into the orientation, okay. you can set it so down to vertical. It's, now. it's not always vertical when you say you would like to have right. it vertical. Then yeah, exactly, vertical. you can choose. That yeah. So that on itself is not a very interesting demo, right? So that's why you yeah. see that I put all these things here. Because the other feature I wanted to show is mm -hmm. the error handling for a REST button. Again, the REST okay. button has been there for a while. Uh, it's basically yeah. to do a REST call and show the information or do something with the information when you're in the context of a form. Yeah. or page. And um, it looks like you want to do that based on the status code, at least when I look at your right. Yes, exactly, there. exactly. So what I have here, I've got some input here, and then in the button, I'm calling mm -hmm. some uh, local API that I've got running here. It's a very, okay. very simple API. Uh, and basically here, I'm mapping okay. the error responses into, as you can see here from yeah. this expression, I'm so mapping at, them into- At the top, you actually have the responses you had previous already, right. the default responses, and now yeah. here at the bottom, uh, it's new that you can prevent the default error message and you can map right. uh, yeah. the errors. Yeah, okay. exactly. Normally, if you would do this, it would highlight. It would show you like a kind of highlight banner on the top of the page yep. uh, that there was an error. But now you can actually intercept this and do mm -hmm. something with it. And that's exactly what I'm doing. As you see here, REST error, REST status code. Yep. So here, if you go into the visibility, you can see mm -hmm. I'm simply saying this yep. panel is visible or this text display, sorry, yep. is visible yep. if there's a response. So you have a nice condition basically in there yep. which you can use just show it yeah. when we want to show it, yeah. Correct. And here I've got something similar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, here it's a bit more elaborate where I'm saying okay. if it's status code, well, the rest example is the name of the button. Um, so if the status code is not 200 and mm -hmm. it's not 404, that's important for the next one. You'll see in yeah. the second Y. And I have a rest error, you're going to render the, the, you know, rest, oh, the, 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 red, the red thingy, the alert and the error. Yeah. And then lastly, uh, basically the same thing here, but now when it's 404, I'm rendering mm -hmm. it. Okay, so let me just show you how this works. Yeah, um, and go to nice. global work. So you have in the background, uh, background and yeah. the rest endpoint, which we are now Correct. going to call. That so if I call Valentin, and this okay. is going to be a 200 call, it's going to yeah, respond, yeah. hello, Valentin. That's nice. you know, it's not a very, not a very fancy Can, can, can kind you of also thing. say, hello, everyone? And then it's saying, hello, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, of course. You're thinking I hard coded this, right? Yeah, yeah, hello, of course. Hello, everyone. <laughs> right. But I also coded it that yeah. if I write fail, it actually will throw a 500. Uh, okay. So now error, we are right? going to see a red L. Here we go. We, yeah, go. we see now exactly the hard coded, yeah. you see a hard coded to fail error, but normally you would get like, I don't know, a network okay. timeout. And this is full error. I don't yeah. know. Something goes wrong, how, right? How do I trigger now the 404? Yeah. So I also coded that if I write unknown, it will return okay. a 404. And here we go, right? That this okay. Is. So uh, this allows you to flexibly catch, intercept this, yeah. this error and do something for the user with it. I mean, the example here is very okay. demo-like, of course, but, right? But in reality, you can do some very fancy yeah. things with this. Now let's move on to the part I'm really excited about, the uh, master detail view. I think you have yeah. something prepared around that one as well. Yeah. That's correct. So let me open it because here we go. And it does requires some explanation. So I wrote, uh, I made a very simple example here. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the most detailed component. I just drag it yeah. onto the canvas. And um, I see you have a subform basically correct. inside the master detail view. This one here, and it's good that we go into that one first. Yeah. Um, so basically this is a very classic person context. You mm -hmm. name it, it's kind of form, first name, last name, place of birth, yeah. type, registration. It's not really important. The thing is, when I configured here, I drag this subform yeah. into the master detail component. So if I'm viewing my item, my whatever I'm, I'm building here, yeah. is going to render this particular uh, yeah. kind of here, now, For the viewing, I think you even configured that it is just yes. viewing, so that one is correct. actually marked as enabled false. Yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah, here we go. Okay. It's false. Um, and basically what I'm building here behind the scenes is I'm building a rich structure. I'm building a mm -hmm. list and site, right, being the list. I'm building yeah. a list of rich objects, mm -hmm. basically. Right uh, now, this is just the viewing part. If I want to create it, you click yeah. this button here, and I okay. reference the same subform here. Okay, that's why you're really... using a subform yeah. in the background, since that you don't Correct. need to model it basically twice yeah. or even yeah. three and times. 
Exactly. And if, if my creation form would be very different, of course, I could mm -hmm. not use a subform and use my own yeah. kind of components here and do whatever I want. That, that, that doesn't matter. It's up to you. Um, yeah. And similar for editing. So if I now go into the edit mode, you can yeah. see the button here changes. You can also change the button and, and text and all of that mm -hmm. here. Uh, but I'm re yeah. reusing the subform and we also have a delete. Yeah. And basically the delete doesn't have a form, but you can say, you know, you can change the button here and it will render at runtime. Yeah. You configure so it. I think for those things, it's also interesting to know that in the background, it's just stored in the form right now since we configured the data source right. to static, but you basically. can also just use a REST-based data Rest, source and yeah, exactly. yeah, you yeah. can configure the buttons with your yeah. REST endpoint and it will execute yeah. it directly yeah. from your form. Exactly. Here, I'm just using static. I can change to REST uh, mm -hmm. if I want to make it persistent immediately, right? I'm, I'm yeah. also binding it to context. That's the value I'm storing it into the forms variables. I'm reusing here first mm -hmm. them as an ID just because it's demo aware, but I'm, yeah. I have flexibility how I want to render these things on the on the screen. But let me show you how this looks like, right? Because that's mm -hmm. more interesting. So let's go back to work. Here we go. This is the subform. Don't, oh, sorry, this is the master detail. Don't yet look at the table example below. Yeah. That's for escalation later on. Um, so basically clicking this one here renders mm -hmm. my subform. So let's just write John Doe, place of birth is Brussels in Belgium. Mm -hmm. The bronze one, the registration date is the 2nd of July. There we go. And okay. if I now click this, it's mm -hmm. going to render my subform again, okay. filling in the data of my item here. If I want to edit it, yeah. then I can do like edit. Okay. There we go. Update it. It's being changed here, right? I can create another one just because one is just nothing, right? Jane Doe and yeah. she's born in Ghent in Belgium. Here we go. Registration date. I don't know. Here we go. And create. Okay. So. Okay. That's the kind of master detail uh, component, which is very yeah. powerful to put these things. Now, I told you that we have this table component. What I did mm -hmm. here is at the same time, I had a panel here and I bound it. And this is already a teaser. Let me remove it. <laughs> we have some new features in the uh, data table. And you already okay. saw it, right? It's, it's the filtering. Um, so let I me mean, go the to- The filtering was there already before. What is yeah, the yeah, new yeah, kind yeah. of filtering? That's, that's true. So basically, let me find the columns here. So here, so uh, what you can do now is on, for example, on the content on content mm -hmm. type, compact type, sorry, I can write a selection component that will be rendered yeah. in the header, as you saw, and it will be able to filter down from that mm -hmm. column or from those rows, all those rows with that particular value, yeah. or for the registration date, uh, here I can set now a filter type date range, right, which okay. I did, and it's allowing me to filter within a certain date range yeah. for those rows. That is um, nice. There is an extra interesting thing here, Valentin, mm -hmm. which is something that wasn't there before, is we have now something called default types. So I know mm -hmm. it's a date. So instead of rendering it as whatever we store it, right, or whatever yeah. the user is storing it as, I could say this is a date without time, render it like yeah. that. Similar here, this is really interesting, is a user ID. So if we mm -hmm. say this, this column is a user ID, it's actually going to render the real name of the user yeah. instead of just showing the ID during the backend call, REST call, and all of that, just yeah. by saying this is a user ID. That is really nice, especially before yeah. it was a little bit fiddling around with an it HTML is. component. You, and now that's, you can just select exactly. that. That's all, that's all, that yeah, that's all history now. Easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, format, really important. I know lots of debate about what's the, the yeah. one format to rule them all. Well, you know, this is the one yeah. we use in Belgium. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that's why I formatted it this way. Oh, so okay. if I now that's show nice. you how this looks like, uh, you yeah. see, because I bound my uh, contacts, uh, mm -hmm. the variable in my form, to the same thing here in the the table, I have them yep. here, I enable the filter. I can now, of course, I only have two rows, so you got to have a bit of an imagination. But yep. if I say first to the tenth, and you see yep. only one Okay, it there, works. It, it yeah. works well. Yeah, works you, would, well. you would need to add now 10 more items, yeah. but we exactly. don't have the time to, to do, do that. that. No, so. because we want to show some more stuff, right? Yeah, okay, then let's do that. So you um uh, since three fifteen we already have query models. What is new in three sixteen? Yeah, there is two highlights here. There is new types of parameters we support for building these queries, and there is a new component called the query data table. And as the name implies, mm -hmm. it's a data table where the rows are backed by query models. Okay, so I, think I can use is... that component in forms yeah. and pages. Exactly. Let me just show you how okay. that looks like. Right. So I've yeah. got design here. Got a small example already created and I'm going to open up my query model. Mm -hmm. now, this was all the same as before in 315, but what's yeah. new here, if I now go to filter, you can see that I can now define input parameters.
parameters. And mm -hmm. these input parameters, they are really the dynamic part of your query. Okay. So if I look at this query here, it's a fairly simple one. I'm basically yeah. saying, I want to get all the process instances by a certain name, right? But this name, mm -hmm. I don't know it yet. It's a dynamic one. And they're either active or they're finished. Now, okay. there are one a couple question of new... Here, your, um, why yeah. can you not change the existing parameters? Why are all of them disabled? Yes, yes, because they're used. The moment I would okay. remove them, uh, you know, let me just quickly show you. So if I create a new one, let me just do mm -hmm. A, A, B, B. And you can still also see here, these are the yeah. new ones, like, you know, finished name and all these mm -hmm. things here. So if I, for example, say business key here, and okay. I would business add key a filter. here would mean basically that this value you have provided is equal yeah. to the business key. Exactly. So if I use it here now, you can see it's now basically disabled because it's used mm -hmm. and I cannot remove it anymore for the input parameters because I need it. Uh, for this query if i remove it again you can see yeah. it's now enabled and i can okay. move it again so that's kind of how it works um now if i want to have a static value because sometimes it can be that i don't want to have a dynamic value actually i already know that the table i want to show on the screen is going to show a list of let's say instances with a certain business key or a certain name or whatever let me just show you then you would say here hey i want to have all the ones with the static business key and you know, this is my key, yeah. right? Not, not a great example, of course, with the business key, but you yeah. get the idea, right? You statically define something and the query, you don't need to provide mm -hmm. it. It will just do it, execute it at runtime, right? So this is the query model. And basically this is all you need to do, right? I now can have a page and let me mm -hmm. go to that page. Um, I don't, need, don't want the changes. So I'm just going to ignore that. I have a page here. Now on this page, what I have, I've got an input mm -hmm. text field here, search text. Remember yeah. that it's important for my binding later on. I've got a checkbox. You know, showing yeah. the finished instances and so nothing the new instances, basically right? there are just a few old components and i assume no. that's a exactly new, uh query that's the new query data table exactly and what you can do with a query data table is you link it as you can see here to a query mm -hmm. model once you link it to a query model i can now open up the columns right so let me do it here and i can now select all the columns exposed okay, by so the query. So if you add custom variables, they will show up similar here. to the data object data table then where you link it to a data right. object here, yep. we just link it to a query model. Yep. So to what we have in Elasticsearch. Exactly. The, the concept is exactly the same as the data object data table. Basically you select it, you configure it and that's it. You don't need to type yep. anything here. Now, remember that I have three input parameters and you can see that I have yep. them here too in the input mapping. And basically, this is where the magic happened. This is where I'm binding the dynamic values from my search text, from my text yeah. field at the top, and those two yeah. checkboxes into the input so, parameter. Now, technically, what yeah. happens is, is I'm feeding that into the REST yeah. API. That REST API then calls the query model behind the scenes, transforms it into Elasticsearch query with the real values, gives back data, and then, you know, being shown as rows in my uh, so you my could data have table, even right? something more complex in here where you use one value from your form twice yeah. or do some calculation with kind of yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or you could have something where you have a value and you use it multiple times yeah. in the query you know the reverse yeah. way so yeah. you know that's you know your imagination yeah, is a limitation <laughs> as i tend to say as always indeed um so let me show you how that looks like yeah. i already have it running in work i just created a couple of mm -hmm. you know random uh, the process yeah. data here, not much, just, you know, we're really bad at naming things. Um, so this is the page you, I just mm -hmm. showed to you right now is just showing everything because yeah. I haven't filtered down anything, but you can see here, I've got the names. If I write something like 316 so in here, it's you can see clearly it's not a now prefix the... search. Is it some kind of wildcard or how does no. it work? It is a wildcard search so behind the scenes. So there's all kind of elastic search kind of, of magic happening here when I'm searching and it's ignoring kind of capitalization mm -hmm. and all of that. So that's pretty cool yeah. stuff here, right? So I can just, uh, and if I do these checkboxes here, mm -hmm. like I want to, I only have one yeah, finished yeah, instance, yeah. right? And now it's only showing this one and the active ones here. And if I do the combination, yeah, yeah behind the scenes, of course, there's a lot of yeah. things happening. It's feeding it into the REST API. That's a public mm -hmm. REST API, by the way. So you can also, if you have other use cases, you can call these um, these query models now okay. in a public so REST API, which you could when do. When I have a normal data table, I could use that as well. But yeah. that one here yeah, obviously exactly. is way if more convenient. Is more powerful. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Convenient yeah. and more powerful, I would say. You know, more powerful in the way that you know, uh, really quickly getting to a result. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it, right? If you you can do all kind of crazy things here and all kind of cool new use cases with uh, query models. I so, really can see yeah, how that is useful.
Now the next topic is flowable control. Joram, mm -hmm. in flowable control, I think uh, we have as a new option uh, turning off the async executors. Yeah, that's indeed correct. So if you see here on my screen, we are in control. And if mm -hmm. you go into the system info, job info, yeah. this was already there before, right? But mm -hmm. uh, where you get all kinds of information about the async executors we have in, in the Flowable platform. Um, but if you now open up, for example, the async executor for BPMN, and we're going to yes. create a little process later on just to show that, you see here is now an active flag, right? Mm -hmm. If I uncheck this one, and if I update, here we yeah. go. Then it's going to basically spread this across all of the nodes uh, that you have mm -hmm. in your flowable in, you know, setup, basically. So if you have one node, fine, just one. If you've got multiple ones, okay. it's going to ripple through and basically eventually, because this is not instant, yeah. we put something in the database, they, we will read it, and then we execute it. Basically not to kind of clog the engines uh, by pulling this stuff all the time, right? So you okay. do it, wait a bit, and then but okay. I think While the best we are way waiting, is right? yeah, yeah, we can uh, show the process which we exactly. Have to execute. Exactly. So then... as you can see here, I've got a timer job example. It's mm -hmm. a very simple process. Nothing is really happening. Got a task, yeah. got a boundary event. I put the boundary event timer on two years, so we got some time okay. to basically. Yeah, we have two years it. to actually wait exactly. until it exactly. will fire. And then it escalates. So yeah. if I uh, deploy this and I go to work, here we go. Okay. Deploy it. Go to work now what we expect now is that we are going to see the task the timer event will execute eventually we can exactly. actually look at the timer job and yeah. control as well exactly and that's what we're going to do jobs um, and the timer jobs here you can see the timer mm -hmm. is now here it's waiting until 2026 to be executed okay. that's still a yeah. long time right um yeah. so i mean well one of the new features that we added in uh, 316 is you can change now the timer is right straight into control there's a button okay. here schedule a job that is right. nice the move yep. job button was already there before. With that, we could directly execute it. And now we yep. can say at a specific time, exactly. uh, let's execute And there, you can put here now a new time in. This is in the mm -hmm. ISO uh, 8601 format. I just copy pasted this thing here. Um, yeah. 8601 also means I can put things in like uh, PT, what is it, uh, one year or whatever, like the format, yeah. right? Just, yeah, P I just copy this thing now here. Be in one year or PT yeah. one age would be in one yeah. hour, for example. Yeah. And basically, I mean, I mean, just putting it in the in the past, right? I'm putting it like more than a week ago, just to make sure that the timer is already due. Yep. So I'm just going to reschedule it. Here we go. Okay, so um, now it should here, right? immediately fire since well, that was in the past. Exactly. But remember, we uh, disabled yeah. our async executor. So if all goes well, here we go. It isn't working, right? Yeah. So okay. I can do this forever, right? The timer job is not going to be picked up because we shut down the async executor. And this is a useful okay. kind of thing you can do if you're in an emergency situation, like for whatever reason, your mm -hmm. jobs are going crazy or you made a mistake and you want to just stop the job executing. Right? This is a, yeah. let's say an invasive administrative operation. Yeah. Right? Um, so let's enable it. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Update. All right. Now, as I said before, this is going to ripple through through all the nodes. So it's not instant, right? right? So we have to talk a bit. Now, there is a good thing because there was actually a feature that I also used that you didn't yeah. see yet in my uh, okay. yeah, BPMN process here in the escalated task, I actually used a new feature, which is called mm -hmm. tenant variables. As you can see here, I'm using tenant dot and then something, mm -hmm. right? And this is probably a yeah. JSON variable. Um, this tenant dot actually means it's a tenant variable. This means it's, it's a variable set on the tenant level. Everybody, every user of the tenant can access this. Um, you can put things in here that, for example, uh, a URL, uh, that you use for testing mm -hmm. purposes and you change it while testing from one system to another system where you go from yeah. testing to acceptance environment and, and stuff like that. Now, so you can make it specific basically to each environment, but you could also, in case yeah. you're using multi-tenancy, make it specific to Correct. every person Correct. or Correct. every tenant. Yeah. Yeah, um, like and I'm going to just going to show you. It's here in platform. Basically, it's here in tenant variables, and you can see I just created one for the demo purpose. Mm -hmm. It's my tenant variable. Remember that's the one I used before, yeah. and it's a JSON type, and it has an escalation user ID, shame bone. So if all things go well, the okay. task after the timer fires, it should be escalated to shame bone. Now let's okay. have a look. If that means the assignee of are... that task is yeah. shame bone. So in the best Correct. case, when you Correct. now go back to timer jobs, we will see that the job is gone. Exactly. There we go. The job has been picked up, right? No timers yeah. anymore. I can click this forever. No timers anymore. We enabled the async executor. The timer was yeah. picked up. It executed. And if I go into work and basically go back and forth here, here we go. We're now in the yeah. escalated time, mm -hmm. uh, escalated task, right? And as you yeah. can see, 
the tenant variable was picked up and it is assigned to Shane Bowen, not to okay. the administrator that I'm logged in, but to Shane Bowen so the tenant variable work. So this was one small example, but basically showing a couple of things, async executor, activation uh, disabling, mm -hmm. tenant variables, and how we could change the timer dates in control. Um, there's plenty more of stuff that we added to 316 yeah. um, for control, think, but have a look at the release notes. Yeah, for yeah. example, I think the upload to different tenants from the app, so you yeah, can directly point. pick the good tenant point. there. Yeah, and indeed, all the indeed. other nice stuff. So reading the release yeah. notes probably helps here when you're looking for flow of the control features. Now we still have a few other improvements which we are not going to show, but quickly talk about. Joam, what do we have around accessibility? Yeah, so basically the accessibility is an important kind of thing in certain industries for sure, but in general, it's an important thing. So what we did with this release is we went through all of the existing components we have in global work, all of the UIs, all of the things in the form engine uh, that, that gets rendered on the screen and made sure that they adhere to the WACG uh, standard. And that's an important standard for when it comes to web accessibility. And basically make sure that, that uh, anybody with a kind of a disability is able to use the UI uh, in, in some way or the other. Um, yeah. So yeah, a lot of work that you don't immediately see. Yeah, I think that makes show. a few of our customers really happy. Uh, next thing on the list is that we have now LDAP support in Flowable Design. Yeah. Correct. Um, so basically in work, you could already do that. You could already out of the box configure it to hook up to your Flowable, I do an LDAP basically with design also do that but you yeah. had to go through hoops to to make that happen and it was not the same as this work so we streamlined that experience now so that what is there in work how you connect it to an LDAP yeah. and LDAP for the people that don't know it's a central kind of store for users and group that pretty much all the companies in the world have uh, and for global design so it now works exactly the same. You can do that now with the out of the box images which we provide Correct. which is really nice. Then Correct. we have yeah. also the PDFA uh, for the template generation I believe is there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, that's one that uh, uh, customers have asked for quite a bit, mm -hmm. honestly. Uh, and it makes sense because uh, let me just show you what it does. I mean, there's not oh. much to it from, from a modeling point of view, but the implications are quite important. So let's say the generate document task mm -hmm. here. There's now a section, as you can see here, PDF compliance, and you can select either the A or the B kind of, kind of sub uh, thing, uh, PDF um, compliance type. The important thing is that when you generate a PDF in this way, it is meant for archival. That's what mm -hmm. the A actually stands for. And it, it has certain implications. Like if you open up in any kind of tool, let's say you open up in Adobe, yeah. uh, then it just can't be edited, right? This is okay. the kind of standard that says this is for archival. So whatever is being put into this PDF yeah. is now cast in stone for so years to come. Basically, and that's a final version then of the PDF and not correct, something that you fiddle Yes, around. And in many industries, this is really crucial to make sure that the PDFs can't be fiddled with for mm -hmm. kind of audit purposes, for you know, any kind of purposes, yeah. you know, uh, do this straight into the, the configuration of the generate document task. Cool. There are a lot of changes below the hood. Is there something you would like to highlight, Joram? I mean, we always upgrade to the latest and greatest uh, third-party dependencies, and we use a lot of kind of uh, open source dependencies coming with our own open source heritage. Um, the most important one, backend-wise, of course, I mean, on the front end, we always upgrade to the latest React and all yeah. of that. Um, but uh, worth mentioning is a Spring Boot kind of upgrade because mm -hmm. uh, People use global work as a kind of end product to distributable as is, yeah. but many customers also use it to build their own custom projects. And that means building a custom Spring Boot project. So in 3.16, as always, we've upgraded to the latest and greatest Spring Boot 3.3 at this point. Check the release notes for the actual minor version at the end. <laughs> uh, and basically, yeah, make sure that we're um, working with everything that comes through that, because if you upgrade Spring Boot to the latest, yeah. it comes with a ton of other dependencies. So mm -hmm. our automated QA, which runs on all our supported environments, make sure yeah. that everything works and keeps working as it was before. So uh, that, I think that's, that's really nice. So yeah. thank you, uh, Joram, uh, for uh, uh, being here in the video. Thank you for showing Imagine. all the gross, uh, great new features. And uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.